Second world. Peacekeeper's world. 23%. We did dry volcano. Dry. It was a dry heat. Not as much to worry about. I love how this game feels. I like the vibe. It's pretty funny. I mean, I went and played a bit of the um, PS1 remaster. No, I, this is the remaster. I played the PS1 original just a little bit at the end of the stream. Just to see if I'm losing any, like, natural charm or something from it. But from what I saw in the first world, it's a pretty faithful remake. Which can be tough to do when... Because if you're remaking a... Um, by the way, I love the feel of being just like this galloping... Bull. Dragon. It's cool. Galloping is a really interesting feature. Because the spaces are so big, it makes sense to let your character run really fast. At the uh, risk of like... Well, you can't, you can't fire your flame while you're doing that. And you can't, can't glide. And you turn a little slower. Which makes sense. But he moves so well, too, without it. The movement, the movement they nailed. And they give him a lot of speed and a lot of movement for traversing these big environments, which is really smart. Like I said yesterday, that was one of the issues with Banjo-Kazooie for me, is that the levels are big, but he's very, very slow. I mean, you can have the thing flip over and walk on the bird's feet, but it makes a kind of an annoying sound. You know, that was pretty annoying. Just from the small amount of time I was doing that. You can really feel like a dragon. I like the way his body sort of spreads out as he's galloping along. He did such a good job. You gotta nail that core stuff. And they did. Magnus. Hey, Spyro. Sparks the Dragonfly has been doing a good job protecting you. Make sure to keep him strong by feeding him lots of butterflies. Yeah, the traversal feels good, and you can really feel where Insomniac got their ideas for, say, Ratchet and Clank. The way the levels are set up, the way the enemies are, they have that real Insomniac enemy personality. <laughs> They're very deliberate in how they have the enemies react, and the animations. They're very confident and deliberate, and they try to make something that is just inter interesting to see and uh, has a lot of personality. I'm quite su I'm quite surprised with how good this is. And how good of a remaster this remake is because it's it's a PS1 game, you got to do everything from the ground up. And from what I saw, it looked like it's done very, very faithfully. Even this font here, like when they, when you play the game and it goes, the adventure begins. And I thought, oh, that's, that font they're using is such a, so ripped off from like Pixar or Dream, DreamWorks. That's how they do a lot of movie font and stuff and like mobile game font. But that was actually what they did in the original game was that font. It just looks a lot more pixelated. This I don't use too much, the L1 and R1 which I did backwards to how I set it. But when you're ro rolling around, you can use that as like a, a side roll, which is actually pretty inventive for the time. Putting that in the shoulder buttons and having people dodge left and right, like you're flying, but on the ground. Because, you know, as we know with Dark Souls and everything, the dodge roll has become incredibly important. Who's this, who's this guy? Oh, Jesus, you're not friendly. Yeah, the way those things explode, it's so insomniac, it's so ratchet and clank, it's just, um... They just, you know, they kind of remind me of the, like, the composer Hans Zimmer, who will, um... You jump over? 
remember that? No. We will take simple ideas and blow them up huge. And that's what it feels like Insomniac does with Ratchet. This. We want to have a crate blowing up. Let's focus on the sound, the light of it, and just... All right, this guy's going to teach us. Miss me. Or oh, you just charge him, okay? You pull shields, you charge. <laughs> okay. Got me. It's like a matador and I'm the pole. Okay, so that guy just charged straight and I got him. That guy was distracted by this big fat lady. So we, we have about two enemy types here. Big fatties don't like getting burned. And guys with metal in front of them. They don't like getting... charged. <laughs> and apparently the um, music... I was reading an article, uh, Stuart Copeland, the drummer from The Police, composed the original soundtrack, which is so cool. Which sounds like this. Yeah, you can hear it's less quality. Obviously, it's more compressed. And they weren't able to have dynamic music back then, which is something that they wanted. Where's my dynamic camera? It's active, yeah. Interesting. Doesn't seem all that active to me. Anyways, but they couldn't do it. They didn't have the memory to um, have the music sort of fade in and out, depending on what was going on. This game's so good. <laughs> Be interested to see what the levels are like when they get harder. So that was something that they added later on. Well, well not later on. In this remaster, they were able to have this uh, dynamic music. So when there's enemies around, they bring in more bass chords and stuff, hard stuff, and when you're just out here and about, they keep it more airy, less percussion. So we'll hear it change as we go up to these guys. Well, that was a bad example. <laughs> because the song was going into sort of a down period. Way to make me look like a fool game. I like these little challenges of chasing after these guys. I'm kind of bummed out that I didn't play this when I was a kid. Because, man, this would have been great. I don't know. I don't know why I never bothered, I guess. I think I thought, oh, a game with flying, it's going to be kind of cheesy. Not cheesy, but it's going to be... Like, do I want to fly around as a big purple dragon? And realize how good Insomniac was? Because there were just, there were a lot of bad platformers then. Especially 3D ones. It was still, it was a new time. And I was, it was, this game came out in 1998. So I was playing Ocarina of Time and Metal Gear Solid, but... I would have loved this. What's that over there? A lot of secrets to find. But it's not just about the secrets, it's... It's like, does it feel good to move around and... And attack people and do the moment-to-moment -moment stuff? That, that has to feel good. You don't have that, you've got nothing. You can have a great story. Yeah, that's all you can have. You can have a great story, but... I've always been more into... telling the story through the gameplay moments. That's the stuff... that I'll remember. What I found through gameplay. Try. Sure, I like a good story in a game. Naughty Dog tells great stories. Um, there's great stories in RPGs, and especially CRPGs, like... How's a dragon supposed to flame metal armor anyway? Remember, Spyro, flame won't work on metal, but charging with your horns? That should do the trick. That's so cool that they actually have it look like metal. A nice visual cue. Like a rock, paper, scissors kind of thing. You know. Wow, there's just so much bloody expression and animation. Insomniac are so fucking good. 
and it's taken me so long in my gaming life to discover them. Oh, why do they have these carpets here? That's nice. <laughs> what? What a nice choice. This, does this mean something? Why'd they put them there? Interesting. Because these ladies like to stand on their carpets, so they would have put the carpets there? I'm such a big fan of them now. I'm, I think I'm gonna have to go and... Carpets just for you. It's just for... I guess it's for this lady to get up here. Or I wonder what it looks like from this angle, if they would have done like... Uh, they thought that would match the blue pennants. Welcome Horky, buddy. Yeah, I think, uh, I think I'm gonna have to go through as many Insomniac games as I can. Just to really get sick of them. But at least to enjoy the ones I'm gonna enjoy and... Just to kinda get more familiar with, with their work. Which is funny, I say that I like it because... It feels familiar already. You know, this feels so good at, at what uh, Insomniac was doing in Ratchet and Clank. Jesus. I'm interested to see what uh, and what the more difficult levels are going to be like. Especially the parts you were struggling with, too. Just like a really enjoyable game to move around in. In that sense, I don't really mind the collecting, because the traversal is just done so well, you know? Man, there's a lot of chests that need maybe keys. Oh no, they're metal, you dummy. You just gotta charge them. No? Maybe I need more of a supercharge or something? Yep, got the supercharger there, Miss Byro. Made in America. You bitch your ass. Sometimes, I wish they would put these chests in ways that... So, like, if you knew what you're doing, you know what I mean? If you could have went, BAM! Fire! Jump up! Actually, I guess I could have done that. And it would have been really cool. This, because this game is sort of built on that dash, you could have some really cool moments with keeping momentum going and stringing things together. This, this feels like how I would want a Sonic game to play. All about keeping that momentum going. You know, like nuts. They tend to put these things against the walls. So you, uh, it can be kind of easy to smash your head into the wall. You weren't here at the very end, Horky, when I was playing a bit of the original Spyro. To be fair, I loaded it up in a browser emulator and the sound was awful. But I got the gist of how it would look and play and run and stuff. I don't know if it would run smoother in an em like a real emulator. you glide there and find out I like that these dragons all kind of have this sort of common personality in a way they're sort of arrogant dicks which is what they would be they're the lords of the land they can fly they can breathe fire you know in the opening cutscene the dragons say we have nothing to worry about from nasty the nork He's ugly. And then he crystals them. I wish you could unfree the ones that don't even say thanks. <laughs> Just press the undo button. What the hell? It's on the other side of that river. Why don't you glide there and find out, you fuck? <laughs> like, what a jerky thing to say. Why don't you fly there and... Th that's his thank you. I saved your life. Let me glide there and find out. Fuck, what do I owe you? Fuck you! You're like, fuck you. Why don't you stay in a crystal? Piece of shit. But I love that. That's like... An, it's a nice amount of snark. In a mascot game, right? Which was one of the big complaints of Ratchet. 
Why do I want to call it Ratchet 4? Ratchet PS4. Look at him shake his little ass. Christ. Is that they totally changed his personality. And the personality of the robot. He was more like a snarky mechanic. And the robot too, they felt like... They felt a lot more real. And then they wanted to tie in with this movie. And they ended up... Um, just like totally taking all the life out of them. Son of a bitch. And making them... In their, in their eyes kid friendly but the problem is kids don't want people to just be stupidly nice all the time this isn't the teletubbies you know kids can handle a bit of uh snark and attitude have you, have you talked to kids they're not always very nice bart simpson that's what they want <laughs> I went to, I went touch my naming a character from a 28 year old cartoon. But really, I mean, like when I grew up, all the, all the cartoons had attitude. You know, they rode skateboards and they're like, screw you, mom. And, well, they would never say screw you, but they'd be like, this is boring. I need to be extreme. Where are my sunglasses? Oh, yeah. Fuck. You know, like, what if the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were just really polite? Pardon us, Shredder. We cannot... We cannot sanction your foot cleanse buffoonery. Hey! I will not sanction your buffoonery. A famous line said by Tommy Lee Jones, the actor, when he was in a movie with Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey as the Riddler. Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face, a really silly, campy Two-Face in Joel Schumacher's very silly, campy Batman Forever, starring Val Kilmer. Uma Thurman as Poison Ivy, who speaks like she's in a 1920s or 30s romance movie. Yeah, when you make him overly nice, it takes out the humor. It just, it just takes out the, like, the personality, too. It's just so silly. It's... Nobody likes people that are overly nice. When somebody's overly nice, you instantly respect them less. You think, what's going on? It's almost like when somebody's trying to, instead of selling you something, it's on extreme discount. Or they're trying to give it away. You think there's something wrong with this. And it's the same thing with people. They're way too nice to you right off the bat. You think, this person's weird. What if somebody was like really trying to, you know, uh, hook up with you or saw you as a romantic partner but they were just throwing themselves at you i knew this girl so beautiful and would just throw herself a guy and they would be like get away from me because they knew or they thought there's something wrong here and i tell her that i was like you know if you just stopped trying so hard you'd have so many guys throw themselves at you and you could just pick because you, you make yourself look like you you're ninety percent off. If I were you, Extreme I'd discount. Over there. Now people think, "Ooh, boy, what's wrong with you?" Fucking Christ! I didn't use the fucking whirlwind. Oh, here it is. Thanks, guy. You need, yeah, you don't want to be a total asshole, but there, there definitely is, like, um, you know when you're at a restaurant or a coffee shop or something, and the owner or the server, the barista, they got a bit of attitude, and you try to get them to like you. Overly friendly people come up as ass kisses and pushovers. Yeah, totally. There was this book... My friend lent me called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And the book kind of turns people into total pushovers. There's there's some cool ideas in it, but people don't really respect that. Like, yeah, you don't want to cut everybody down. You know, there's this, also this phenomenon of, like, whoever talks the most 
becomes the de facto leader in a group that doesn't have a leader. Even if you're just kind of talking shit. You're not saying anything. You just keep talking. Your opinion starts getting weighed. It's like a social situation. We had a guy come by and work on our... Uh, uh, fix our toilet. But he doesn't have a... He, he doesn't drive. So I had to go pick him up. And then... He wanted to go some other places. I was like, alright, I appreciate that you came in when you didn't have to. So I'll drive you to some places. And then we go... And then we drop his tools off, and all of a sudden we're having a conversation with somebody working there, or who lives there. And they're having a beer and stuff. And it's kind of going on a long time. But he is talking a lot. <laughs> so I talked a lot and I became the plumber. <laughs> uh, that's who they decide who the professors in the class, right? Whoever talks the most. Like Donald Trump. He just endlessly talks. He'd be like, this guy's really smart. Anyways, this, so, the, but this guy, he was talking a lot and kind of the three of us in it, it kind of changes the social dynamic. You can feel it. You f at least I do. You feel, you know, you start choosing different things you would say and um, different things seem to have different value. And then the kind of more I would talk, I could steer it back in my direction and just a psychological thing. What's over on that river? Nothing much. Oh, look how much those gems glint. <laughs> Orc, you're hilarious. <laughs> just imagining the person talking and then they're just putting the plumbing belt around them. And, uh... Oh. And I know. Okay. Now, that's too far, asshole. I've been listening to this podcast called Smartless, where Jason Bateman and Will Arnett of Arrested Development, and for some reason, Sean Hayes from Will and Grace, they're friends with this guy for some reason, and they interview people, and, and the trick is that one of them brings on a guest secretly, and the other two don't know anything about that guest, so they have to ask and I guess the, the point is, like, if you bring on somebody who's... If it's like a Joe Rogan kind of situation where you bring on a... I don't know, like an expert on bees, then there's a lot of questions asked. And then they kind of ran out of people like that and they just started bringing on comedians and their friends, right? So it doesn't really matter. But what I noticed is, like, the Sean Hayes guy, he, oh, he compliments everybody so much. And for me, if I was a comedian going on a show and you... Don't start off and say, this person's one of the funniest people we know. They always make me laugh. Everything they say is so funny. How can you... Where can you go from there? Don't say that, you know? Because people... Like, saying something funny, there needs to be a... Uh, a misdirection, right? So... If you start somebody off like that, then you kind of put the audience like, Oh yeah? Hmm. We'll see. I'm trying to cross my arms on camera. We'll see. Make me laugh. That's not where you want to start. That happens to Jerry Seinfeld when he'll pop into comedy clubs and do an impromptu set. And the, the MC might like build them up and be like, The funniest person after to have lived. And, and he has to tell them, Never never do that again. Never say that again. Just bring Bill Burr on. Actually, Bill Burr was the other guy, I think, that had said that, where somebody introduced him and said, He's the funniest person ever. <laughs> but I noticed that with Sean Hayes, where, every, I mean, I guess he just, he likes, genuinely likes all the people he's had on the show, but every single person he has is like, everything you do is so amazing. And you're just killing it with everything. Ugh. I think in creative people, they do have usually, especially performers, have a need to be liked. Because that's why you're a performer. Usually. But they also usually have an imposter syndrome, so you need to walk the line of, like, not giving them... You just don't want to put them in a bad position right off the bat. Oh, he's he is the greatest. 
I listened to him on Conan O'Brien's podcast, and it was pretty funny. Not in the traditional sense, but the first half, I thought was a total train wreck. It was... Bill Burr and Conan's style is very different. Conan's very absurdist and self-deprecating, and Bill Burr is very realist and grounded, and he wants to actually say how things are and then find the funniness in how things are. Whereas Conan is more like, what if the situation was extremely different? And every time, and I could tell that Bill Burr wanted to just come on and not use any prepared material because he was trying to find things in what they were talking about. And I could, he, I could, he, it felt to me like Conan was kind of panicking if things weren't working out. And he kept jumping from like topic to topic. And then, and then by the end of it, they come up and it, and it starts to become funny. But it takes him like a good half an hour to get there. So are, are we done here? This game is so fucked. You got the egg. Uh, you got the three dragons, so... I don't know. Do whatever you want. Should I be getting more gems? I don't know. Do whatever you want. Why don't you go find the gems? The, the game itself has the attitude of the dragons. Of this, like, cocky... Standoffish. Oh, Conan and Jordan Schlansky are so good together. There's a little bit of, um... I mean, Conan is very old school, and he's a Boston guy. And he does have, like, I think he tries to be progressive. But he, he also grew up in an era where, like, you would get bullied for everything by white, big-headed Irish Boston, Bostonian people, and, you know, get called a retard and a fag and all that stuff. So he comes from that world where bullying is, is just a way of life. And sometimes when he bullies Jordan, like, and and also calls out like, he's really this way. We're not making it up. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that Jordan is somewhere on the spectrum. And to make that the selling point of it and be so dumbfounded, like, people always ask, what's with this guy? Uh, yeah, he probably has like Asperger's or something. But I love their dynamic together, and Jordan's so funny. And sometimes I do see him um, kind of break. So I think, oh, I think he's a bit on in on the joke. Like, I, he, he gets what works. Reviewer said Spyro has stiff controls. I mean, if you're charging everywhere, the turning is slower, but that's the point. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's stiff controls. A little bit. So, you know, sometimes the, like, the joystick movements are a bit... They can be a slightly not super resp responsive. I don't know. I think a lot of game reviewers fucking suck at games. <laughs> I can't take any review seriously now unless I look at other games they reviewed and see what they have to say about that. Um, like, remember when we were... I was all excited for Mario Golf. And a guy gave it on IGN like a 6 out of 10. And then I went and saw, okay, what did he review? Okay, well, he reviewed Disco Elysium. And he gave it a 10 out of 10. All right. And I saw some other things he reviewed, and I thought, this, uh, this guy knows what he's talking about. And then I played Mario Golf, and I go, yeah, this guy knows exactly what he's talking about. This guy, you know, Mario Golf had serious issues. Then you look at something like the Skyward Sword review, which is a 10 out of 10. And you look at the games this guy reviews. First off, that's easily the best game he's ever reviewed. And that's Skyward Sword, so that's not saying a lot. They get this guy to review crap. And, like, the opinions he has on these sort of crap games, too. You realize, okay, well, that's... Say what you will. Skyward Sword is, is fantastic for um, the Zelda fans who love the puzzles. If you love the puzzles, you got so many puzzles. And what's his name? Um, Big Boss Steve that comes to the streams and he commented that it's like about the pacing that I was complaining about. Sometimes you just have to pace a game yourself. And I get that. You know? You gotta... 
you've got to decide what you need to do and you can have more fun that way. Yeah, I guess if it gets way more difficult, the controls could rear their head. For sure. And also, like a lot of old platformers, Spyro can uh, punish you for... The hell of thing. Spyro can, can have a bad punishment for missing something and like... You know, if I miss that glide, I've got, I've got to walk pretty far back to get it, you know? That's something that I think Nintendo's usually very conscious of. When you... If you fail, how long is it going to take for you to try again? Oh, shit. And it's kind of got these little interesting things. Like, okay. They don't tell you where those gems are. There's one. That's fun. That's fun. Wait a second. Maybe there's something to do with these carpets. What if I, like, run on them? Will it make them fly up into the air? With my bull charge? Oh, my God. Look how many freaking gems I just got. Hmm. Very interesting. You collected everything in the levels you played. Wow. You didn't get all the way through? You didn't get 120%, as they say? I really, really like this game. I think it's a real achievement. Okay, let's get over there. You got a bit bored? <laughs> I can see that. Inky boy! Oh. Yeah, it doesn't... You do have to kind of motivate yourself a bit in this game. And also it can be like... The signposting can be a bit weak in this game, and the motivations can be kind of a bit weak. You love the motion blur? Look what it looks like without the motion blur. It looks... it looks hideous. Look at that. Oh my god, gross! Look at it! What is that? Oh! <laughs> ah! Oh. oh shit. That was disgusting. I need the motion blur. So this Daryl, you're thinking it's maybe just nostalgia that makes Spyro one your favorite? I'd be interested to see like what do they change in Spyro 2. I played it for a few seconds and um a few minutes. And what did I discover? There's a hell of a lot more story and interruptions. Every, it seems like everywhere you walk, they stop and talk to you and show you a cutscene. At least in the beginning. You know what I would have really liked? So instead of when you, uh... Okay, so you have to... You press square to run like this, right? You can't blow your fire. So to blow your fire, you have to stop and then press R2. Why don't they just let you press R2 and then that cancels the run? And then maybe he does like one last kind of gasp or something. It's it's irritating to, uh, to let go and then press R2. Because it feels like you're... Lo well, first off, it's really jerky the way he just stops. I don't like. And also, it just makes you feel like you didn't maximize the amount of momentum you had, you know? Yeah, he does, he does have a nice air hump about him, doesn't he? You know what I mean? Like, okay. So I was running there, and then stop, and... That's a bit jerky. And really, you want to be charging a lot. Obviously. Get all that speed. Cliff Town, we were just there. I'd say this... Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, sometimes when you... When you go kind of left or right, he does jerk over there pretty quick. That could be it. I mean, stiff controls is something I've just heard a lot and wonder, what does that actually mean? Stiff controls. 
It's almost like he reacts too much. Thank you like that. <laughs> oh, let me massage you. What was that a fucking eclipse? Wow. Blah, blah. Girls, oh yeah, you're loving Death's Door. <laughs> These guys go down pretty easy. Combination of charging and the camera that was screwing you. Did you use the uh, follow camera? The active camera? Yeah, Inky described it as a 10 out of a 10 so far. Nice. Got me. Where'd that guy go? Math memory, yeah. I have that. I have that fear. Where is that? Where did that guy go? They just disappear. I like that. It's the women just forcing these guys. So if I, if they're gone. That might uh, stop me from getting all the gems I need. Oh, my fear, you know sometimes you come up and there's multiple paths, and if one of the paths is in an immediate dead end, and I think, oh, which one should I go down? I like, keep going down, and I'm like, should I turn back and go to the other one so I can quickly finish that one and come back? I don't like that. Rondo. So did all the adolescent dragons get so crystallized? Cool. You don't know what it's been like listening to him over and over. But I tell you one thing, he should watch his back. Oh, interesting, Marky. Photo near photographic, eh? Wow. Burn him in the ass. There we go. Look at that sweet little butt. I think the biggest difference is that the... This is me just like tapping the joystick to the left or the right. As opposed to the slower kind of turning where he's charging. It feels more like a... You're steering like a jet ski or something. Ooh, you tracked me there. That must drive you nuts watching me play then. Death Door to me looked like... Potentially really, really, really strong game. I'm glad it worked out for you so far. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't give it a full recommendation to anybody because I'd only played the first, you know, first parts of it. Son of a bitch. Fuck you. What is the point of the dodge if I can't dodge you? Just like, it's like one of those old games where you have to, uh, you have to jump away. Or we'll just get him when he turns around. There we go. Puzzle solving, dick face. Oh, I see. So he's doing something different each time. That's cool. <laughs> this that was so great. He had different attacks, he had to figure them out kinda like a little mini Dark Souls. 
and you burn him in the ass. It really makes you feel like you're burning him in the ass. Why would I want to return home already, you son of a bitch? Oh, do you want to go home? You got the one dragon in this whole level. Oh, this is kind of a boss level. Oh, I see. This game's so strange. Good pacing, graphics, music, combat. Challenging or frustrating. Yeah, I, yeah, that's what I liked about it too, is that the, uh... Can't charge big fatties. Was the, uh, the bosses that I faced felt good. Not, an not annoying, you know? It wasn't like, we're gonna make this so fucking difficult. It was just, it was a fun little challenge. Still epic, satisfying. Do I have to do this guy again? I didn't I didn't get much from I just got health from dealing with that guy again. There's one key. A lot of chests and only one key. I mean, Mario used touch damage as opposed to an enemy attacking you or swinging at you because uh, they didn't have all the animations, you know? It's like, we're just, all we can do is have the Goombas and the Turtle Shells walk into you. Or Pac-Man. The ghosts were deadly. Or the barrels from Donkey Kong. Or bullets from, uh, you know, old school shooters. box intersection, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's way, 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 way easier. I could do it. Probably not. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to tell where you're gonna land. Look at these dragons just sitting on their fucking ass. It's gonna take a long time to do my uh, rock sculpture. I'm sitting. I am sitting. So that was it. That's the level. You wanna get some more gems? You can if you want, but we don't care. This game does not care. Alright, exit level. I think, uh... I think they realized from this game... Their next game should be more linear. That's where why Ratchet and Clank... Ratchet and Clank is this, but linear. So you get to the end and you're done! And there, yeah, there's little secrets you can go and explore and stuff, but you get to the end and you're done. And make it more set piecey, More exciting action. This is kind of like Mario Odyssey in a way, but... Still just not enough, uh... <laughs> there's just no, like... What would you call that? Closure to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, and there are some more open areas in uh, Ratchet. There's sort of like a swampy area. Pretty open. But even the open ones kind of have like different linear paths that wind around. Good. Make sure you shouldn't be able to fly. Unless his body's completely hollow. Ooh, ice cavern. Oh, the boss is not a boss. Oh, no, 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 no. oh, 